ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد او بريز is due to Allah we seek his help and we seek his forgiveness whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides then can lead astray and whoever is left astray cannot be guided aright i bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and i bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his slave and his messenger wa seekum wa nafsi bi taqwa Allah i remind you and myself to have a sense of god consciousness a sense of taqwa a, a sense of knowing that we will be taken to account for what we say and what we do. Dear brothers and sisters, there is a nation that was described by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, khairu al-qurun qarni thumma alladhina yalunuhum thumma alladhina yalunuhum. That this is the best of nations who are with me and those who follow them and those who follow them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described this group of people, kuntum khairu ummatin ukhrijat lin-nas. You are the best of all nations who have been raised for mankind. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ We have made you a group that is moderate in nature so that you may be witnesses over people. This is the group of people that Rasulullah, he was selected to be with. This was the generation that because of their virtues, they were selected to be the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu described them. He said, كَانَ وَاللَّهِ أَفْضُلُ هَذِهِ أُمَّةِ Ummah. They were the best of this nation. وَأَبَرَّ قُلُوبٌ And they had the most righteous hearts. وَأَمَقَ عِلْمًا And they had the deepest of knowledge. وَأَقَلَّ تَكَلُّفًا And they were the least in wanting things. قَوْمٌ أَخْتَارُوا الله a nation that Allah chose them to be the suhbah, to be the companions of Rasulullah. Chosen by Allah to be the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should know and recognize the virtues of these people. You see the concept of stories, which we don't have time for these days. People have a maximum three minute concentration span, enough for a swipe. Enough for, you know when you have your Instagram that you watch the beginning of a talk and then it says click here to continue. People don't even click to continue anymore because the concentration is only for those two, two and a half, three minutes and that's it. Reading is becoming a thing of the past. To read a book, to know the Hayat al-Sahaba, Hayat al-Rasulullah, Hayat al-Anbiya, it's become a thing of the past. To read is a dying skill. To revive this. Teach your children, teach yourselves to know the stories of the Sahaba. So many books available. PDFs, if you really want to d- addicted to the screen that much, read it on a PDF. But get the books, read the stories of the Sahaba. We should know about them. The impact of stories, the human being needs stories. You know when you're in difficulty and you hear another brother is in a similar position? Marriage, family, kids, money, job, any test, you feel, ah. Oh, He's going through it through. He's going through it too. And it makes an impact on you. You feel, subhanAllah, I'm not the only one in this predicament. If he can do it, I can handle it. This is a test. If he went through it, I can go through it. Stories have an impact such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the method of stories in the Quran to impact on human beings. You know, there's a social study experiment. A guy bought five items from eBay for 20 pence each. 
a little model, a little Play-Doh, a little picture frame, 20 pence each. Then he commissioned writers. He commissioned writers, he said, <clears throat> To these writers, for each object, I want you to make a story. So this picture frame was given by my great-great-grandmother who lived in Somerset, who had a farm. And then she passed it on to her daughter and she went to move to London. So he wrote a story. Then he put the story and sold the same items on eBay for 10 times the amount. That's the impact of a story. A story makes you understand what somebody is going through and makes you connect with that person is going through. The story I want to touch upon today is the story of a great Sahaba. One of the greatest companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, such that Rasulullah described him that no tree has shaded, or no, no dirt or mud has carried on this earth a man more truthful in speech than him. He said that you want to understand the humility of Jesus. Isa ibn Maryam, you want to understand the humility of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, then look at this companion. Who was he? His name was Jundub ibn Janadi, ibn Sufyan, ibn Ubaid, ibn Haram, ibn Ghifar. Known to all of you as Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. From the tribe of Ghifar. And this was a tribe of Ghifar who were not tradesmen or landowners. This was a tribe of bandits and criminals and gangs. That was their trade. He grew up in this environment. You know, the reverts have a colorful background. Wallahi, if Allah chooses to guide you, no one on the face of this earth can change that. If Allah gives you tawfiq for salah and hamiyat al-Quran and hamiyat al-dhikr Allah, no one in the world can change you. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was raised in this environment of bandits. Robbing caravans from Iraq and from Sham. And he never felt right about this. Again, those of you who go through your own journey of Islam, where you had your rough days in college, you mess around in uni, you chill around at 18, 19, 20, you have the wrong crew, you run with the wrong people, but it never sits right in your heart. You want to run around with a knife, with a blade, with some drugs, with some hash, with some brown. You run around doing these things, but it doesn't sit right in your heart. You buy a stolen TV, big, LCD, flat screen. Right? Skanked, stolen. You get some stolen bikes, you get some stolen mopeds, whatever. It doesn't sit right in your heart. And that's from Rahmah min Allah that you have a little bit of shame left in you to know what's right and what's wrong. Abu Dhar al Ghifari, he didn't like this environment and he left. He took his mother and his brother. And afterwards, later on, when he became Muslim, later on in his life, they used to ask him, what did you do before you knew Rasulullah? He used to say, I used to pray to Allah. They said, how did you pray to Allah? You didn't even meet Rasulullah. How did you know what to do? He said, I used to just fall down on the ground and at night time, ask Allah to help me, to protect me, to give me a way out of my troubles and my, my perturbed heart. And then I would lie down the night and then at night, in the morning I could, hear this, I could feel the sun shining onto my back. This is what he used to do. He took his mother and he took his brother and they went to the outskirts of Mecca. They left their tribe. You know, it's like you surrendering your British passport tomorrow, voluntarily, with all the securities, the financial and rights and, and social service, uh, social security that you get. You surrender all of your protection. That's what he did. Nobody did it in those days. Ayam al Qabaili, no way a man would leave his tribe because your tribe was your protection. But he left the tribe because he felt they were on the wrong path. He went to Mecca, they disbanded their tribe. And he came there with his brother Unais. And Unais, he said, go to Mecca, see what's going on in Mecca. So we went to Mecca, Unais, he looked around, he had a day in Mecca, he came back in the evening and he said, Ya Abu Dhar, there is somebody who's, who feels like you. He said, what does this man call to? He said, makarim al-akhlaq, to have good manners, not to tell lies, not to be deceitful, to help one another. Abu Dhar said, what are the people saying about him? They said, he's a kahin, he's a magician. And he said, they, some people say he's a poet. And Unais was a poet. And Unais said, wallahi, I am a poet. But wallahi, what comes from him is not poetry. Abu Dhar then went and hid in Mecca. He was new to Mecca. 
You know, like someone comes new to your area, people, you know, shake their head, oh, who is he? Someone moves in. But he was hiding around the areas, not to be noticed, until Ali radiallahu anhu, who was a child at that time, saw him and said, you're somebody new in this area. What do you want from this area? He said, I want, and I will only tell you if you don't tell anybody. Because this is the time when Islam was hidden. This is the time when they weren't announcing their Islam openly. He said, I will take you to Rasulullah. I want to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he took him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Abu Dhar went to him and he said, I am Abu Dhar from the tri tribe of Ghifar. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam put his head on his hand. He said, Ah, the pirates, the bandits. And he said, I never thought somebody from their lineage, somebody from that tribe would come to Sirat al Mustaqeem. Abu Dhar said, what is this that you're telling people? What is it that you're teaching people? Rasulullah recited some Quran and the hand he there and then accepted. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka Muhammad Rasulullah. He bore witness and he became a Muslim. <coughs> Rasulullah told him, Ya Abu Dhar, go back to your tribe and teach them Tawheed. Go back to your tribe and teach them la ilaha illallah. He said, no, I am proud of this deen. I'm going to shout it in the vicinity of the Haram. With the Kuffar and Quraysh there, I'm going to shout it and announce my deen. And he did this. He went outside the Kaaba and he exclaimed and proclaimed with the great happiness he had for La ilaha illallah. And they said, As-Sabi, As-Sabi'un. You know, the people who changed their deen, they used to insult him and say, Ya Hadhu As-Sabi. And they attacked him. And they beat him. They beat him such that he looked like the altar where they slaughtered the animal for their idols. Full of blood. And they beat him. And they beat him. And they beat him. For la ilaha illallah. Until Abbas radiallahu anhu came. Who was the uncle of Rasulullah. And he said, Ya, what are you guys doing? Do you know who this man is? If you kill him, Bani Ghifar, they will rob you day and night. Release him. Leave him. Otherwise, they will rob your caravans all the time. To get revenge for you killing one of their tribesmen. Abu Dhar picked himself up, cleaned himself, went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He went back, re was uh, um, recuperated, went back to his mother and brother who accepted Islam. They became Muslim. He went down back to his tribe as Rasulullah told him to do and half of them became Muslim. This was the da'wah of akhlaq and the da'wah of haq to souls which are hungry for the truth. And then years, years later, Rasulullah moved to Medina. You know, all of the steer, I'm fast forwarding. I cannot do justice to the life of Abu Dhar in a khutbah. This is just snippets. Rasulullah moved to Medina. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari said, I want to go to Medina too. And then the rest of his tribe converted al-Ghafar to Islam. And then the tribe next to Ghifar al-Aslam, they converted to Islam as well. Sallam Allah, Rasulullah said about the tribe of Aslam. Sallam Allah, may Allah give you peace to the tribe of um, Aslam. And to, uh, uh, and, and to uh, Ghifar, he said, Ghafar Allah, lah. may Allah forgive the Ghifar, using the words of their tribes. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called upon them. And later on, as I close this part of the khutbah, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari used to say, Osani Khalili, he used to say, my close friend advised me. Because Rasulullah, after Rasulullah passed away, he said, I have learned these pieces of advice from Rasulullah. And he said, this was, this was the advice he gave me. And this was advice that changed him, reformed him, because he was a Sahabi who stayed with Rasulullah in Medina, served him in Medina, studied with him, learned with him, slept in the masjid. He was this companion who stuck with Rasulullah. <coughs> he said, Ausani and Khalili, my best friend, my close friend advised me. This is after Rasulullah passed away. He said, have taqwa. This is the head of advice. Have a sense of God consciousness. Know that you will be taken to account by Allah. He said, Zidni. Abu Dhar asked Rasulullah, Zidni, give me more. He said, Alayka bi tilawat al-Quran wa dhikrillah. That you should recite the Quran and do as much dhikr of Allah. He said, Zidni, give me more. He said, Beware of laughing too much, for it deadens the heart. Qalb. He said, Zidni, he said, Give me more. He said, Alayka bil jihad, fa innahu ruhbaniyati ummati. 
He said, upon you is to strive in the way of Allah, for it is the monkhood, the ascetism of my ummah. He said, Zidni. He said, Alayka bitul samt. Fa'innahu matradatun li shayateen. He said, stay quiet for long periods of time because it chases shaitan away. Wa'awnu laka fil amr deenik. And it will help you in your affairs of your deen. He said, Zidni. He said, Ahabbul masakeen wa jalisuhum. Like the poor people, the low trodden people in society, the people who have less, like them and sit with them. He said, Zidni. He said, Unzur man tahtak wala tanzur man fawkak. He said, Look at people who are in a less fortunate position than you. Don't look at all the people who have more than you. And wallahi, if you guys did this, we would feel like kings the way we live in our lives. He said, Zidni, give me more. And he said, Rasulullah said to me, Speak the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth even if it is bitter. And these seven things changed his life. And later on in his life, Abu Dhar al Ghafari used to say, Lo kuntum ta'alamuna ma a'lam, if you knew what I knew from sitting with Rasulullah and to know that our souls will be taken, you will become old and gray, you will be buried and you will face Allah. If you knew what I knew, you would never sleep with your wives, you would never sleep in your beds comfortably, and you just spend your time in ibadah. He said, I wish I had just been a tree that was just chopped up and used as wood. Abu Dhar al Ghafari was one of the greatest companions of Zuhd. And they were ones who would always leave this dunya for the akhirah, give up. And even though his ending, which I will refer to shortly, with what he went through, was very profound with which situation he was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his soul. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lasha'ir al-mu'mini. Astaghfirullah ghafurur rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Salatu salam ala rasul al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la ila yawm al-deen. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, they were human beings selected by Allah for us to relate to. Human beings by their nature make mistakes. But where you and I differ and the Sahaba differed was they were quick to change. They accepted their mistakes and they changed. The sahaba were people close to Rasulullah. They were on a different level, a different plane that we should try to aspire to follow. In the ninth year of Hijrah, when the Muslims were, prepared to face, were preparing to face the Romans for a second time. This was a journey from Medina to Tabuk, which is very difficult, and it was in summer. And many of the people on this journey, because they were munafiqeen, people who showed Islam, apparently, but inside they had no concern for the Akhirah, or Allah, or Quran, or Rasulullah. In fact, they were enemies of Islam. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they used to exist. And they would go with Rasulullah on the jihad, on the battles. But halfway through, some of them would turn back. Oh, we've become ill. Oh, I've got a problem back home. Oh, I have to get back. And this was a particularly difficult journey. And many of the people who were there at the time returned back. And the Sahaba used to say to Rasulullah, Fulan, Fulan has turned back. Fulan, Fulan has turned back. And Rasulullah said, La'allahu fi khair. Maybe it's good for him to go back. He'll be less headache for us. And it is good for him. One day Abu Dhar was coming and he had a weak camel and he was at the back of this particular caravan such that the distance between the main caravan and his camel became almost half a day. His camel collapsed and there he was left with a choice either to catch up with the army or to go back to Medina. He took off the saddle, put the saddle on his back and he ran to catch up with Rasulullah And as he came after a half a day's distance running in the desert they saw someone coming from the horizon. And Rasulullah said, I hope, I hope that is, it is Abu Dhar. Yarhamullah. And then when Rasulullah saw it was him, exhausted, he said, Yarhamullah Abu Dhar. May Allah have mercy on Abu Dhar. Yamshi wahda, he walks alone. Wa yamut wahda, and he will die alone. Wa yab'ath wahda, and he will be raised alone. This was the spirit of Abu Dhar. Never giving up. And people who are resolute about their Islam, people who are not lazy about their deen, people who are not heedless about their deen, men and women who deep down understand you have a purpose on this planet. 
You won't let anything come in the way between you and getting ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those of you who are serious about going to Jannah won't allow yourself to be distracted by frivolous activity and frivolous talk and wasting your time in ghafla. This is what he did, Abu Dhar. He picked himself up and he ran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And as I close this khutbah, years passed. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari traveled to Syria, Bilad al-Sham. Then he eventually came back to Medina. And he lived on the outskirts of Medina. In a place called Rabada. And he lived with his wife and his servant. Alone from the people because of things had changed. Rasulullah had gone. Fitna had started. Problems, politics. He stayed away. And as he was on his deathbed, his wife was weeping. She said, who will do your janazah? We are out here. Who's going to do your janazah? There's nobody here. He said, take my body, put it on the road, wrap it up, and inshallah a caravan will come, a qafila, a caravan will come, and they will do janazah for me. So Abu Dhar breathed his last breath. And all of us will have this. There will be one breath that will come out of your mouth, which will be your last one, dear brothers and sisters. Every single one of us sitting here, there will be one breath that will come out and you will never breathe after that. Abu Dhar breathed his last breath. And his wife, she did what Abu Dhar asked. She wrapped him up and she put him out on the street. And a caravan was coming from Iraq. And in this caravan was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And he said, who is this? Who is this jasad? Who is this body? He got off his camel. They said, this is Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. And he started to weep. And he said, Sadaqa Rasulullah. Rasulullah spoke the truth when he said, he walked alone and no one could follow you. You died alone and there will be nobody with you. And you will be raised alone. And that was the end of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. These examples of the Sahaba, dear brothers and sisters, the stories that we have in the Quran are not here for us just to read and to feel emotional about in a khutbah or emotional about in a lecture that you listen one day, you're feeling a bit soft in your heart and you play a track to listen to a story of the Sahaba or the Anbiya. These are stories we should learn to study to have an impact on our life. These are stories that should change our benchmarks on what we want to aim to achieve in our lives. These are stories for the women of Sahabiyat and the Sahaba are stories and incidences because they were human beings. They were not angels. You know, Abu Dhar had the famous story where he had a row with Bilal bin Rabah. They had a row. And this is Black History Month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed racism. When Abu Dhar said to Bilal, he said, you son of a black woman. And then Bilal went straight to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, look what this man has said. And Rasulullah said, bring Abu Dhar to me. And what did he say to Abu Dhar? That inside you is still jahiliyyah. Those of us with the cancer and disease of black and white and yellow and brown and this from this tribe and from that from that tribe. And even the, 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 the way we discriminate between elders and youngers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us a clean slate. You've seen Malcolm X. You've seen what he said when he went on Hajj before he was a black supremacist. When he went on Hajj, what did he say? He said, I never imagined to see the white man, blue eyes, sitting with a black African, sitting with an African American, sitting with an Asian, eating and sleeping and talking as brothers. America needs Islam because this is the one deen that eradicates racism. These were examples of the lives that we have. Why? Just to listen to the speech? No! to change ourselves, to reflect on the incidences, to become a better Muslim, to aim higher. Half term has come and gone. One week. Those of you who have wabalik and you have enough sense to organize your time, what did you achieve? Did you just sleep? Did you just watch Netflix? Did you just watch dramas? Did you just run around with your friends in the town and outside? How much Quran was done? How much Arabic was done? How much dhikr was done? How much dua was done? How much did you cry to Allah? Time is going to go. You're going to become white like me. Slowly. Day by day. And then boom. You will breathe that last breath. 
like Abu Dhar al Ghafari priest. Allahumma aslah, Allahumma aslah ahwal al Muslimin. Allahumma raddahum ilayka raddan jamila. اللهم فرج هم المهمومين من المسلمين ونفس كرب المكروبين وقد الدين على المدينين وشف المرضان ومرضى المسلمين اللهم اجعل إخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان في كل مكان في كل مكان من كل هم فرج ومن كل ذيك مخرج ومن كل بلاء عافية ومن كل عسر يسرى يا رب العالمين اللهم لا تدع لنا في مقامنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرت ولا هما إلا فرجت ولا دينا إلا قضيت ولا مريضا إلا شفيت ولا مبتليا إلا عافيت ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة هي لك رضا ولنا فيها الصلاح إلا يسرتها وقديتها يا رب العالمين اللهم من أراد ومن أرادنا وأراد وإسلامنا وأمننا بسوء اللهم شف شف اللهم شف اللهم شف اللهم شف اللهم فشغله في نفسي واجعل كيده في نحري واجعل تدبيره تدبيرا علي اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم اغفر اللهم اغفر لمن حضر هذه الجمعة والديه وافتح الموعظة قلبه وأذنيه واغفر لنا وله يا رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين